Alright then, here we are once again in War Thunder, where today we're going to be taking a little look at everyone's favourite Soviet light tank, the BT-5. Now, in this video we'll be going over the history of this tank. The technical details and indeed the example battles will be in future videos, so you can all look forward to that. In the meantime, let's put on our dark blue boiler suits, secure our padded tank helmets, and try not to be purged by that nice commissar as we are lined up against the wall of the history of the BT-5. Like with most of these videos, we must begin by going back to the First World War. The Western Front, as we all know, was relatively static. It was characterised by lines of trenches, deep mud, thick tangles of barbed wire, and the ever-present danger of machine guns, rifles and artillery. This incited the Western Allies, i.e. France and Britain, to create vehicles designed to advance across this terrain to engage the enemy. This vehicle was, of course, the tank. These armoured behemoths were well suited, albeit some more so than others, to wading across the mud and wire of no man's land on the Western Front, utilising armour that was proof against machine gun fire, caterpillar tracks to spread the vehicle's weight across the soft mud, as well as to provide a large surface error to maximise traction on this slippery surface, and some method by which the vehicle could cross trenches. On French tanks, this usually came in the form of some sort of tail skid, whereas British tanks were built in a shape designed explicitly to maximise trench crossing capability, which was of course the iconic rhomboid shape of the British heavy tanks. The Eastern Front, however, was quite different. Here, warfare was much more mobile, and while trenches and fortifications were often used, the focus of military strategy was to outmanoeuvre the enemy with speed and agility. This meant that the slow, lumbering tanks of the Western Front, which were suited to a battlefield where speed was not as important as protection, firepower and the ability to traverse harsh terrain, would not have been effective on the Eastern Front, they were simply too slow. This meant that Imperial Russia fielded almost no tanks in its war with Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Russia did, however, make use of the armoured car during the First World War, which were much more suited to the wide open terrain typical of Russian battlefields. Russia therefore utilised a wide array of armoured cars, both imported such as the French Charon Model 1905 and the British Armstrong Whitworth Model 1913, and domestically produced, albeit usually using foreign chassis and other equipment, such as the Mgibrov Renault and the Putilov Garford. While these armoured vehicles were relatively successful in Russian service, being fast enough to be used in the manoeuvre warfare of the Eastern Front, they required hard, flat ground to be able to perform at their best. The weight of their armour, which was typically mounted on a very overloaded truck or car chassis, made these vehicles quite clumsy to control and often dangerously unstable and top-heavy, especially with the added burden of weaponry, ammunition, fuel and indeed the crew and all of their provisions and equipment. This weight, coupled with the vehicle's underpowered engine, overworked transmission and skinny 1910s wheels, meant that most of these armoured cars performed dismally off-road, on any terrain that wasn't hard, flat, dry grassland. While not so much a problem on the plains of Eastern Europe during the summer, when the rains of spring and autumn came and turned the ground soft and muddy, these vehicles would become very quickly bogged down. While Britain and France overcame this sort of problem by using caterpillar tracks, which were themselves a progression from the pedrail wheels invented in 1903, and can be seen on many artillery pieces as a way to spread their weight on the ground, the Russians came up with a somewhat different solution. One morning in 1915, a mechanical engineer named Nikolai Lebedenko approached Tsar Nicholas II with a model of his idea, 
Nicholas was impressed when Lebedinko wound up a spring inside his model and set it off climbing a pile of books on the Tsar's desk. So impressed, in fact, that Lebedenko was granted 250,000 rubles and a team of engineers to build a prototype. The resulting vehicle, built by Nikolai Lebedenko, Nikolai Zukovsky, Alexander Mikulin and Boris Shtichkin, was named after its sponsor. This was, of course, the Tsar tank. Now, this vehicle has already been memed to death, so I'll only cover it briefly. Instead of utilising caterpillar tracks, like the western tanks, the Tsar tank featured a pair of 9 metre diameter wheels, each powered by its own 250 horsepower engine taken from a captured Zeppelin. It was stabilised by a small roller at the back, and would have been armed with an array of weaponry poking out of various sponsons and turrets around the fighting compartment. Only one unarmed prototype of the Tsar tank was built, which was tested at a proving ground near Moscow. In front of a crowd of Russian dignitaries and generals, including Tsar Nicholas II himself, the Tsar tank trundled across a corduroy road before knocking over a tree and then becoming stuck in a muddy bit. At this point, the Tsar had had enough, and the project was scrapped. The Tsar tank itself was abandoned, being unable to be recovered from the bog, and was finally broken down for scrap in 1923. Russia developed one other tank during the First World War, which was a little more similar to the traditional notion of a tank, insofar as it was an armoured box on tracks, or rather, track, for this vehicle, called the Vezdekod, was perhaps the only tank in history to use only one single track. It was steered by two small wheels, one on either side of the wide central track, and featured a crew of one, who both drove the vehicle and operated its armament of a single Maxim machine gun mounted in a revolving turret. Only one pre-production example was built, powered by a 10 horsepower motor. Upon testing, it was found that even with the little training wheels, it's actually quite difficult to steer a tank that only has one track, and so the project was abandoned in favour of imported western tanks that actually worked. One other tank was designed by Russia during the First World War, but it was never built. This was the Mendeleev tank, whose design, initially started in 1911, would have featured armour 150mm thick, a 120mm naval gun, and would have weighed over 170 tonnes. Needless to say, this giant box of pure Russianness was never built, for if it had, doubtless we would all be speaking Russian now. Back in the real world, things were looking bleak for Imperial Russia in 1917. Long story short, by 1922, Russia was now the Soviet Union. Early Soviet tank production has already been discussed somewhat in my video of the T-26, so I'll only go over it briefly. After mainly utilising captured examples of British and French tanks during the Russian Civil War, the Revolutionary Military Council commissioned Soviet designers to construct a domestic Soviet tank fleet. After a short production run of reverse-engineered Renault FTs, nicknamed Rusky Renaults, production switched in 1927 to the MS-1, designed by Professor V. Zaslavsky. MS stood for Mali Soprovozhdenya Pervi, meaning First Small Support Vehicle, with a crew of two armed with a 37mm gun in a rotating turret and armoured with 6-16mm thick steel. The MS-1, later called the T-18, was very similar to the Renault FT, albeit with significant improvements in performance. 960 were built between 1928 and 1931, and despite seeing some action in Manchuria, most T-18s were retired to training roles by 1933. Despite this, during Germany's invasion in 1941, many T-18s were hurriedly pressed back into service, some retrofitted with contemporary 45mm guns in enlarged turrets. Although, due to the poor condition in which most T-18s had been kept, these were usually only used as static pillboxes. 
The T-18's successor was originally to have been the T-19, which was essentially an elongated T-18 hull mounted on the suspension system of the French Renault NC. However, the finished product, completed in 1930, was found to be disappointing. It failed to meet most of its design requirements, and was deemed overly complex and too expensive. The T-19 was therefore dropped in favour of the Vickers Mark E 6-ton, which the Soviet Union produced as the T-26. If you'd like to continue with the T-26's story, then you can do so in my T-26 video, a link for which will be in the description. For the rest of us, it's time to switch our attention to the BT series, and for that, once again, we need to go back to the First World War. John Walter Christie was an American who had made his name building and racing cars. His designs of racing cars were often well ahead of their times. He pioneered the use of a transversely mounted engine and the front wheel drive system 50 years before the Mini, as well as utilising independent vertical coil spring suspension, an idea that was subsequently borrowed by Vincenzo Lancia for his Lancia Lambda, after he and Christie had crashed during the 1905 Vanderbilt Cup. Additionally, the largest engine ever used in a Grand Prix car was the almost 20-litre transversely mounted V4 fitted to Christie's 1907 front-wheel drive monster car, although it broke down after only four laps. After a crash that left him seriously injured later that year, however, Christie decided to move away from the world of racing, although the mindset of building speedy speedy vehicles did not leave him. He dabbled with building front-wheel drive taxicabs and fire engines, but with the outbreak of the First World War, he switched to making military vehicles. However, his personality tended to clash with the US Army Ordnance Board, who demanded exact specifications for their vehicles that Christie often ignored. His first success was instead thanks to the United States Marine Corps, who desired a tracked amphibious tank in 1924. Christie's vehicle, designated the Marine Corps Tank GC-2, was successful in its trials in 1924. Although the GC-2 was not adopted, it proved the concept of an amphibious tank to the Marine Corps, for which Christie was rewarded. J. Walter Christie began working on tank designs just after the end of the First World War, where tanks had proven themselves viable in combat. At the time, the US Army relied heavily on foreign tank designs, such as the M1917 and M1917A1, which are American-produced copies of the Renault FT, as well as a few imported British heavy tanks. The Americans also worked on the Tank Mark 8 Liberty, or International, but that's another story. Christie was unimpressed with World War I-era tanks. Although their tracks enabled them to travel across difficult terrain, such as the muddy wastes of No Man's Land, they also made them very slow. The top speed of the Renault FT, for example, was no more than 5 miles per hour, or 8 kilometers per hour. Tanks at the time were also extremely unreliable, with battles involving tanks seeing as many as 70% of the vehicles breaking down before they reached their objectives. In order for an acceptable number of tanks to reach the front lines to mount an attack, they had to be transported by truck, or more commonly, train. This put pressure on logistics networks, so Christie sought to find a solution a tank that could travel under its own power to the front, where it could then attack the enemy. To achieve this, Christie proposed a tank with convertible suspension, which meant that the vehicle could use wheels on road, then switch to tracks for off-road travel. The US Army Ordnance Department was interested, and granted Christie a contract for a prototype in November 1919. The finished product, the M1919 Christie medium tank, was ready just three months later. The Christie M1919 was a relatively unremarkable vehicle at first glance. It had a cylindrical turret mounted towards the front of a boxy hull sporting a 57mm M1920 gun, as well as a 30 calibre M1919 machine gun in an independently rotating cupola. 
With a crew of three and a 120 horsepower Christie six-cylinder engine, the tank was not too dissimilar from other tanks at the time, save for its suspension system. This consisted of four large wheels, two on each side, as well as a pair of bogies, each with two road wheels. For driving on roads, the tracks would be removed and the central bogies raised, at which point the tank rested on its four main wheels. The rear wheels were powered and the front two steered, meaning that the M1919 in road configuration could be driven much like an ordinary car. The army, however, was not that impressed. When in tracked mode, the tank was found to have poor off-road performance, with a top speed of 7 miles per hour or 11 kilometers per hour. In road configuration, the M1919 could manage speeds of up to 13 miles per hour or 21 kilometers per hour. However, the ride was incredibly bumpy due to the fact that the vehicle's main wheels were completely unsprung. The design was quickly rejected by the army, however they did grant Christie a chance to revise this design for a future series of tests. This revised design, named M1921, was ready a year later. While the drive wheels at the back remained unsprung, the front wheels were fitted with coil springs to somewhat improve crew comfort and road performance. The vehicle itself was drastically altered. The turret was deleted and replaced with a single 57mm gun on a limited traverse mount in the front of the hull. A coaxial 7.62mm or 0.3 inch Browning machine gun was fitted, as well as two additional machine guns in the front corners of the vehicle. The M1921 was also slightly larger than the, um, than the M1919, which allowed it to have a crew of four, although it was an incredibly tight fit. This, as well as reliability issues stemming from the same six-cylinder engine used in the previous model, plus the fact that the M1921 showed no significant improvements in performance over the M1919, and was in fact less suited to the role of combat tank due to its turretless configuration, prompted the army to reject the design after completion of its trials. Christie was a little miffed at this rejection, and so worked for the Marine Corps' aforementioned amphibious tank project for a while, before returning to the army with a new tank design in 1928. Christie still sought to create a tank that could run both on tracks and wheels, but came to the conclusion that the suspension design utilised by the M1919 and M1921 simply did not provide good enough performance under either configuration, and so he went back to the drawing board. Christie realised that the biggest issue, both with his previous designs and indeed most tanks of the time, came from limited suspension travel. A conventional suspension spring required a lot of space to provide only a small amount of suspension travel. The usual ratio is around 60 centimeters of spring for 20 centimeters of movement. This meant that smaller tanks tended to have worse suspension than larger ones, limiting their speed and off-road capability. Christie came up with a new type of suspension, which was of course the Christie suspension system. This comprised a large road wheel mounted on the end of a bell crank, the other end of which is mounted on a pivot attached to the hull, allowing the road wheel to swing up and down. A suspension swing is fitted to the bell crank, typically about halfway along its length. This arrangement means that a suspension spring can provide twice the travel than one attached directly to the road wheel. This system gave Christie's next design, the M1928, some 25 centimeters of suspension travel, compared to the 10 centimeters on the M1921, which coupled with the M1928's four large road wheels on each side, and its powerful Liberty V12 engine generating 338 horsepower, or 252 kilowatts, enabled the tank to reach a staggering top speed of 42 miles per hour or 68 kilometers per hour on tracks, and 70 miles per hour or 110 kilometers per hour on wheels. These speeds were impressive even for cars at the time, and even today some battle tanks struggle to reach 40 miles per hour, which rightly earned the M1928 the nickname of the racing tank. The rest of the vehicle was relatively crude, no turret or weaponry was fitted, 
This was because the main purpose of the M1928 was to demonstrate the capabilities of the Christie suspension. The US Army Ordnance Department was very interested in this speedy speedy boy, and so ordered another prototype from Christie. Despite some disagreements in terms of specifications, the next vehicle, the M1931, was delivered for trials in January 1931. The M1931 was essentially the M1928, fitted with a cylindrical turret sporting a 37mm gun and a coaxial 30 cal machine gun. This extra weight, however, limited top speed to 27 miles per hour or 43 km per hour on tracks, and 46 miles per hour or 74 km per hour on wheels. Ten M1931s were built for the US Army, seven were sent to the infantry under the designation Convertible Medium Tank T3, the T1 being the Medium Tank T1, and the T2 the T2 Medium Tank, and three were sent to the cavalry as the Combat Car T1. Combat Car T1s had their 37mm guns replaced by a .5 inch or 50 caliber heavy machine gun. As to the reason for why the US Army Cavalry called their tanks combat cars, may I refer you to my video on the light tank M2A2. An additional pair of M1931s were ordered by Poland, however, before they were paid for, the US Army took them, designating them as T3E1s. These were identical to the T3, save for the way power was transmitted to the drive wheels in road mode. The T3 used a chain drive, whereas the T3E1 used a more reliable geared drive system. This loss prompted Poland to develop its own Christie type tank, the 10TP, however that will be a story for another video. Following the delivery of the T3, Christie and the army disagreed on how the design could be improved, leading to their falling out. As a result, the T3E2, which featured a redesigned hull with a hull-mounted machine gun, as well as a larger two-man turret, was created at the US Army's request by the American La France and Fomite Corporation. The T3E2 was powered by a new Curtis D12 engine, producing 435 horsepower, or 424 kilowatts resulting in a top speed that was mechanically limited to 35 miles per hour or 56 kilometers per hour on tracks and 58 miles per hour or 93 kilometers per hour on wheels. Finally, in true pre-war US Army fashion, three 7.62 mm machine guns were added to the turret sides and rear, in addition to the coaxial and hull machine guns. Five T3E2s were built, along with one T3E3 with an improved steering system, all without Christie's input. If you want to continue with the Christie tank story, may I refer you to this video by the Chieftain. Christie, who was a little miffed again at the army's inability to understand his creative vision, turned instead to the export market. Despite many foreign governments being impressed by Christie's sports tank, no orders materialized save one. In the dead of night, likely in some dark alleyway, while walking home from another rejection for his tank, Christie was approached by two mysterious strangers wearing wide brim fedoras and trench coats with the upturned collars. These were OGPU agents from the Soviet Union, working in the USA under the front company Amtorg, and were very interested in acquiring Christie's fast tank. Christie agreed to sell two examples of the M1931 to Amtorg for $64,000. However, due to the United States ban on selling military equipment to the Soviets, these were shipped without turrets under the false label Agricultural Tractor. Agricultural, Agricultural Tractor. OGPU also acquired the M1931's blueprints using espionage, and these were spirited away to Russia along with the two tanks. J. Walter Christie sold a few more prototypes to the US Army, none of which were adopted. His last M1931 prototype, which he had already mortgaged, was sold to the British Morris Motors Group to be developed into the cruiser tank Mark III A13. With the outbreak of war in 1939 and the US entry in 1941, 
Christie doubled his efforts to get a design, any design, adopted by the US Army, but never succeeded. He died a poor man in January 1944. The two Christie M1931s acquired by the Soviets were taken to the Kharkov Comintern locomotive plant in Ukraine. Here they were designated Bistrokhodnye Tank, abbreviated to BT, meaning high speed tank. This was later changed to BT 1 as the BT program progressed. The Soviets initially set about replicating the Christie prototypes. The first BT-2 was ready in October 1931. This vehicle was largely identical to the BT-1, however the Curtiss engine was replaced with a KHPZ M5-400 V12, a license produced version of the Liberty L12 generating 400 horsepower or 298 kilowatts. While the prototype BT-2s remained turretless, design testing focusing on transmission and running gear, which was after all the BT tank's main selling point, the production version was fitted with a simple cylindrical turret. This was intended to mount a 37mm Model 33 gun and a coaxial 7.62mm DT machine gun. However, due to shortages of the 37mm gun, Many BT-2 tanks were instead armed with a pair of DP-28 machine guns in addition to the DT gun. A few BT-2s were also fitted with radios, which could be identified by the prominent antenna rail mounted to the turret. Most BT-2s, however, in typical Russian fashion, had no radio equipment. The BT-2 was superseded in 1933 by the upgunned BT-5 after concerns were raised about the penetrative capability of the BT-2's 37mm gun. In all, about 650 BT-2s had been built by this point. The BT-2 was initially used in the vast tank exercises conducted by the Soviet Union in the early 1930s, where constant use and lack of maintenance meant that by the time they were used in combat, most BT-2s were worn out, gaining them the reputation of being unreliable. Despite this, when they worked, the BT-2s were the fastest tanks used by any side during the Second World War, with a top speed of 100 km per hour, or 62 miles per hour. Despite the introduction of the more powerful BT-5, the BT-2 still saw action in several conflicts. They were first deployed alongside the BT-5 in Spain, where they were found to be superior to the Spanish nationalist tanks. The BT-2 again saw success alongside the BT-5 in the Battle of Kalkin Gol in 1939. However, during the Winter War against Finland and during the Soviet invasion of Poland, many tanks, including BT-2s, were lost, primarily due to the Soviets' outdated and inflexible tactics. This meant that, by 1941, only about half the original number of BT-2s were available. Despite this, these survivors were pressed into service against the invading Germans. BT-2s were last seen used in combat at the approaches to Moscow, where the German army was halted in the winter of 1941-1942. The BT-3 was identical to the BT-2, but was built using the metric system rather than the imperial measurement system inherited from the original Christie blueprints. This designation, however, was only used in the factory. BT-3s were categorised as BT-2s by the Red Army. The BT-4 was a further development of the BT-2, however it featured improvements to the suspension system and was designed to be constructed using welding instead of the BT-2's riveting. Welding, however, was a very new technology in the Soviet Union, and due to difficulties encountered during construction, the three BT-4 prototypes were finished with partially riveted hulls. It is debated as to whether the BT-4 was also designed to mount two turrets like on the T-26 Model 1931, with the left turret sporting a DT machine gun, while the right turret mounted a 37mm conventional gun. As it turns out, this is a hoax. Photos you see here were actually photoshopped for an April Fool's Day article in the magazine Polygon. The final variant of the BT-2 was the BT-2IS, 
contrary to popular belief, the BT-2IS, or BTIS as it was initially known, was not built with additional sloped armour. This came with the BT-5IS. The BT-2IS was actually a project to improve the vehicle's performance while in its wheeled configuration. This project was initiated personally by Joseph Stalin, hence the name BTIS, I being the Russian equivalent of J. This included making the second pair of road wheels steering wheels as well as the first pair, and by transferring engine power to the rear six road wheels. Improvements were also made to the tracks, utilising smoother linkages. These changes not only improved the tank's ride quality, handling and off-road capability, both on tracks and on wheels, they also increased the top speed on tracks to 105 km per hour, or 65 miles per hour, slightly faster than the standard BT-2 while operating on wheels. While this was of course impressive, these speeds caused significant wear to the tracks, the increased complexity of the new transmission also made the BT-2IS much more expensive, difficult to maintain and unreliable than the standard BT-2, and so the project was cancelled after only one BT-2IS prototype had been built. The BT-5 was designed as an answer to the Red Army's concern that the 37mm gun mounted on the BT-2 was not powerful enough for modern tank combat. The BT-5 therefore mounted the 45mm Model 32 gun found on the T-26 Model 1933 in an enlarged cylindrical turret. The hull of the BT-5, with its convertible suspension and 13mm thick armour, was unchanged from that of the BT-2, save for the fact that the M5 engine was now sourced from McCulin. With the new turret and gun, however, the BT-5 was rather heavier than the BT-2, which had a negative impact on performance. Top speed was reduced from 100 km per hour to 72 km per hour, or 45 miles per hour. This, however, was seen as an acceptable trade-off for the BT-5's improved firepower. The BT-5 was continuously modified and improved from 1933. The first change was to switch the heavy spoked road wheels with lighter convex disc wheels. This change was also applied to BT-2s then in service. In 1934, the simple cylindrical turret, which was essentially an enlarged BT-2 turret, was swapped to the same turret mounted on the T-26 model 1933. Not only did this make production easier, the new turret was larger and had two hatches instead of the previous versions one, thus aiding with stowage capacity and crew comfort. Command tanks were also fitted with a radio and a horseshoe antenna rail around the turret, similar to that mounted on Command T-26s. The BT-5 first saw combat during the Spanish Civil War, where between 50 and 100 tanks sources vary, were shipped over to fight for the Spanish Republicans. These were crewed mostly by Soviet volunteers but also by members of the Spanish International Brigades who had been trained in Russia. They were first deployed during the Zaragoza Offensive alongside Republican T-26s. While infantry strength of both the Republicans and Nationalists was roughly equal, the Republicans heavily outnumbered the Nationalists in terms of tanks and aircraft, and these were all of higher quality. Despite these advantages, the Republicans lost almost all of their tanks due to failing to realise the potential of the BT-5 in its ability to outmanoeuvre its enemy with speed, choosing instead to weigh them down with troops and attacking head-on against nationalist positions in the open across terrain that hadn't been reconnoitred and which turned out to be marshy. While the Republicans did eventually manage to capture the fortress town of Belchite, they were repulsed from Zaragoza when the Nationalists brought in reinforcements. The Republicans' failure to utilise the BT-5's main strength, that being its considerable speed, left them vulnerable to Nationalist anti-tank guns, which easily overcame the BT tank's thin armour. BT-5s were also used during the three-month-long Battle of Teruel, but again, they suffered heavy losses due to the fact that the tanks were not suited to siege warfare or close quarters street fighting. 
During this battle, the Nationalists even managed to capture a few BT-5s, which they later used against the Republicans during the closing days of the Spanish Civil War. While the BT-5 was a capable enough tank, it was severely let down in Spain by poor tactics, and a failure to understand that its main strength was its speed. The BT-5 also saw some service in China. Following the defeat of Chinese forces in the Battle of Shanghai in 1937, their tank battalions, equipped with Panzer Ones from Germany and CV-35s from Italy, were rather depleted. China therefore decided to purchase around 200 T-26s from the Soviets. They also managed to acquire four BT-5s. These were used in the fight against the Japanese until the end of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1945. The first time the BT-5 was really used successfully was in the Battle of Kalkin Gol in the summer of 1939. Here, the Soviets had the space and the numbers to really use their BT-5s and the newly introduced BT-7s in their intended role as cavalry tanks. This is epitomised by the Soviet attack on the Japanese 23rd Infantry Division in August, where Zhukov's tank forces, supported by mechanised infantry, were able to sweep around behind the flanks of the Japanese forces, in a classic pincer movement, meeting up behind them to attack the Japanese rear. By the end of August, the Japanese 23rd Infantry Division, being completely surrounded but refusing to surrender, was utterly destroyed. However, this campaign demonstrated that the BT tanks were vulnerable to infantry attack with grenades and incendiary weapons, as their petrol tanks were prone to catching fire and exploding. It was decided that Soviet tanks must therefore be supported by infantry at all times, which meant that the incredibly fast BT tanks would be tethered to the much slower infantry during upcoming conflicts, thus again denying them their main strength. This is apparent in the Soviet invasion of Poland in September 1939, and especially so in the disastrous invasion of Finland later that year where the BT tanks, moving slowly with their infantry escort, proved extremely vulnerable to most anti-tank weapons, such as the Polish WZ-35 anti-tank rifle. In Finland, moving slowly in long columns through dense forest and thick snow, the BT-5 was vulnerable to virtually any anti-tank weapon the Finns could throw at it. Alongside more conventional anti-tank weapons, such as the quick-firing Bofors 37mm AT gun and the very powerful La T 20mm anti-tank rifle, <laughs> the Finns employed guerrilla tactics, using ski troops armed with Molotov cocktails, Casapanos demolition charges, and even simple logs or rocks to destroy or disable the Soviet vehicles. Many were later captured and used by the Finns. Following these actions, it was decided that the BT-5 and BT-7 were too lightly armoured. The decision was made to design an entirely new tank using the Christie suspension, but which would feature thicker sloped armour. This project, which will be discussed in detail in a future video, eventually culminated in the legendary T-34. The T-34 had just begun to be introduced into Red Army service, replacing the BT-5 and BT-7, when the Germans and their allies attacked in June 1941. This forced the Soviets to press into service any tanks they could, including BT-5s, in a desperate effort to slow the German advance while factories were relocated and made ready to begin churning out T-34s. The BT-5s were largely wiped out during this time, their last significant action being that at the approaches to Moscow, where the Germans were finally halted in the winter of 1941-42. While the odd tank would pop up now and then during 1942, typically in the role of scout tank or static gun emplacement, the BT-5 was largely withdrawn from service by the time of the German attack on Stalingrad. Today, few surviving examples of the BT-5 exist. Most of these are found in various musea in Russia and, oddly enough, Mongolia, with perhaps the best preserved example standing in the Kubinka Tank Museum. 
The BT-5 was modified into a number of different variants and experimental prototypes during the course of its service history. Aside from the main production models, the initial BT-5 and the BT-5 model 1933 with its improved turret, the Soviets also built a few BT-5A support tanks, which featured the larger turret of the T-28 medium tank, complete with 76mm howitzer. The BT-5 was also used in the Teletank project. This variant was designated TT-BT-5. Teletanks were part of a Soviet project to try to reduce battlefield casualties – yes, I'm as surprised as you are – by utilising remote-controlled tanks to perform tasks that would be especially hazardous to a manned tank. This could include carrying flamethrowers, laying down fire support or smoke screens, or destroying enemy bunkers and fortifications by dropping a large demolition charge near them, similar to the German SDKFZ-301 and 304 remote-controlled charge layers. The teletank, typically an obsolescent light tank such as the T-26, T-18 or indeed BT-5, would be controlled via radio from a TU control tank. While the controls were crude and imprecise, they were used in action during the Winter War. However, the project was abandoned in 1941 in favour of more effective and significantly cheaper crude tanks. Prototype models based on the BT-5 include the BT-5 PKH, which was equipped with waterproofing and snorkels for deep wading. The RBT-5, which we actually have in War Thunder, featuring a pair of launchers for the two-ton tank torpedo rocket, the BT-5OT flamethrower version, and the PT-1A, which was an amphibious version of the BT-5 featuring a radically redesigned hull. The most important experiment of the BT-5, however, was likely the BT-5IS, for this was the first stepping stone on the way to the T-34, as it was an experiment in understanding the efficacy of sloped armour. In all, around 2,000 BT-5s were built from 1933 to 1935, before being supplemented by the improved BT-7 and eventually replaced by the T-34. While the BT-5 was a perfectly capable tank, being one of the fastest armoured vehicles in the world at the time, and sporting a powerful 45mm gun, it was let down by those who used it and their misguided doctrine. Because of the failure of Soviet and Spanish commanders to understand that the unrivalled speed of the BT-5 was its main strength, it was used in the same manner as the much slower T-26 where its thin armour proved completely inadequate. However, this experience led Soviet designers to experiment with ways to improve armour efficacy without sacrificing weight. This led to experimentation in sloped armour, which in turn led to the world-changing T-34. And with that, it's time to bring this video to an end. But don't worry, the story will continue in the future. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching and hopefully see you next time, where we will be discussing the technical details of the BT-5, and how it fares in the wonderful world of War Thunder. So hopefully that will be sometime soon, however, we all know what my schedule is like. Anyways, until then, thank you very much for watching and thank you especially for sticking with the channel through this long wait that you've had to endure, and I apologise for that, and I will endeavour to do better in the future. So, until the next video, thank you very much for watching, goodbye.